Welcome to the Thrive Podcast with the Shiloh Missionary Baptist Church. How, how does your faith kind of play into it or does it play into it? What can be done about it? When I say the church, I'm talking about uh, evangelical white Christians and the black folk who attend their churches. <laughs> Hello, welcome to the Thrive Podcast with the Shiloh Missionary Baptist Church. I'm Fred Jeff Smith, pastor of Shiloh, and I'm very happy that you chose to either view this on Facebook or YouTube or listen to us on iTunes, Spotify, or Amazon. Uh, As always, we encourage your feedback. Uh, You can reach me at Fred Jeff Smith at Cox. Net, and that is wrong. Uh, I've been saying Cox.net forever. Fred Jeff Smith at gmail.com. We changed. It's Fred Jeff Smith at gmail.com. Fred Jeff Smith at gmail.com. Let us know how we're doing and what we can do to make things better for you. I'm very happy today to welcome uh, Ms. Rita Steib, who is a candidate for United States Senate for the state of Louisiana. Ms. Steib, thank you so much for taking the time to come and share with us today. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. So what made you decide to run for the United States Senate? To my knowledge, you have never held public office. Am I correct in that? Absolutely. Okay. So, and and it's interesting because uh, your two other Democratic candidates, your two other major Democratic candidates, I understand that they're more than that, uh, neither one of them have held public office either. So I'm just curious as to what it is that prompted you to jump into politics uh, at the Senate level, the United States Senate level, instead of at a lower level, not not to demean, because I really think all politics is local. But I, I was just curious, what, what was the impetus that caused you to, to decide to, to jump into the United States Senate race? Yeah, so I don't know if I actually jumped in or if it was a long-standing conversation that I was having uh, with God that I was resisting for a really long time. Um, And then finally, at, you know, the beginning of this year, I was like, okay, I'm going to go ahead and do this. I did a lot of research prior to deciding whether or not I was going to run. I ran a poll, a statewide poll, independently on my own, because I was like, surely this poll is not going to come back and be favorable. It's going to tell me, Sarita, you have no chance, and then I would be let off the hook, you Mm -hmm. know. But the poll, what it said was things that I knew already, like I didn't have uh, name recognition here in this state. But the surprising thing was is that in the informed ballot portion of the poll, um, I brought back 41% to John Kennedy's 43%. And what that told me was that he was vulnerable, and if I could introduce my profile to the people of Louisiana, that we may actually have a shot um, at this. So I think that that was the first deciding factor. The second factor was I decided to do a little traveling, and I was like, I'm going to go to northern Louisiana Mm -hmm. because that is the hardest place for someone who looks like me and does the work that I do to get elected. And surely the folks in northern Louisiana will tell me, you know, you don't have a chance. We're not voting for you. Mm-hmm. And that wasn't the reception that I received. I think when I got up there, what I um, intimately understood and almost immediately was that a lot of those communities were suffering from the same thing that um, my small town in St. James Parish, Vashra, Louisiana, you know, were suffering from um, industry and economics leaving, um, spotty access to broadband, you know, poor infrastructure, water quality. And what I begin to understand saying in that moment are there are just some problems that transcend race, gender, um, you know, and a lot of other things. So I didn't get the reception that I thought that I was going to z- get going up there to visit with those folks. And um, I was like, okay, you know, I'm going to do it. So all of the experience that I have working up until this point, I feel like has prepared me for um, being able to create policy, you know, on day one. Um, A lot of the work that I've done, even though I've never held public office over the last five years or so, has been strictly and specifically around um, creating policy, writing policy, passing policy under hostile conditions, you know, um, and on the state and federal level. So um, I think that I'm prepared to do it. But to go back to why this office, um, I just think a lot of times that people in our community don't really understand that 
this position um, of a U.S. senator is the long game. You know, we are experiencing things now in this country from the people that we chose to elect 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, And you're just seeing those things play out now. So, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, the country is in, you know, a recession and we are suffering from inflation. But that's not tied to Donald Trump or Obama. It's tied to people that were in office prior to, you know, and the things that they were able to do and not do um, as it relates to them being in office. So for me, um, I think that this position allows an opportunity to effectuate change for my children and the people that are coming um, behind me and local politics. um, As you say, everything is local, but actual local politics and state politics are more of a immediate gratification type situation for me um and i'm just really focusing on uh, how i'm gonna leave the world um you know when i'm no longer here you mentioned that you have experience with uh writing and passing uh policy uh for our state uh can you share with us uh some of the policy that you have uh, spent a lot of time writing Yeah, absolutely. In 2017, we passed Ban the Box on College Applications Mm -hmm. for Purposes of Admissions, making Louisiana the first state um, to pass that type of legislation. And it was just born out of my experience of, after being released from prison, not being able to obtain an education because there was a box on the application that asked, had I been convicted of a felony? And by checking yes to that box, I was denied an opportunity to go to the University of New Orleans Two years later, I reapplied to the University of New Orleans using the same application. The only thing I did was uncheck the box, and I was admitted within 24 hours because I did have some college credits um, while I was in prison, had a pretty good GPA, and, um, you know, inherently it just it's not right. You shouldn't have to lie, you know, to get an education. I didn't fully understand um, at the time when I was sentenced at 19 all of the other, you know, barriers that would be placed in my way um, by carrying the the tag of being someone who's been convicted of a crime. Um, So for me, it was just really, really important to see that legislation passed. So that was the first piece of legislation Mm -hmm. um, in Louisiana that we passed in 2017. We wrote the legislation. We worked with legislators to pass it. We uh, mobilized a lot of folks to support, um, and it passed uh, the It passed unanimously. (laughs) So um, for me, what I understood in that moment, I had some experiences along the way, um, particularly around testifying and how I was I was received. And we had to, you know, regroup and come back and and use a new strategy. So this was testifying in the state legislature. Yes. Yes. Um, I've had some experience with that, too. (laughs) It, It is not fun at all. Not at all. And it can also be um, very demoralizing, you know, so I was specifically asked questions like, why do you think that you deserve an education over someone who hasn't committed a crime or, you know, just all of these things. And I'm like, that's not how this really works. You know, like Mm -hmm. Pell Grants don't work like that. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, just people asking questions specifically out of a preconceived notion of who I am based on me having a conviction. So, um, We, you know, re-strategized and we found a white woman who had the same story that I had. And she went in front of the legislature and testified and she got a standing ovation and they cried and they were like, you know, hold your head up. You know, you are somebody. And, you know, I'm not going to lie. It really, really angered me. I left out of the, the, the legislature. I had to take a walk, you know, do a lot of. You know, are you suggesting that there might be racism that not, exists not, within the Louisiana legislature? Not suggesting. Really? Implying. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, shocked. Yeah. I'm really shocked to hear that. <sighs> yes. So I, you know, what? But I was so grateful to learn that lesson early on because what it taught me was that I could never take the work that I was about to embark upon personal. Mm -hmm. Um, that it just was not about me. It was about so much more than me. So that experience, um, I think of that humbling in the beginning, I think has served me, um, extremely well. Um, so when we passed the legislation, what I immediately understood was that it affected everyone the same and that, 
I needed to be able to work in those conditions and successfully work on liberating uh, my community and my people um, and not take it personal. So since then, we've passed it in six additional states, working with advocates on the ground um, who have those experiences. Are these all southern states? I'm just curious. No. Um, Colorado, California, the state of Washington, Oregon, um, Louisiana, Maryland, and Virginia. Okay. Um, so... 2018, we put forth some legislation around Dignity Act for incarcerated women, which allowed women to no longer be charged for sanitary items and soap and toothpaste and um, things that are basic necessities. Because what we found um, through my organization, Operation Restoration, that women weren't showing up in programming and participating in a lot of things because they were unable to keep their self um, dignified and, mm-hmm. and, and, you know, have access to the things that they needed to um, maintain their cleanliness. And it, you know, it became a, a a real issue around humanization and how we are stripping dignity of people that um, are incarcerated. And it's wrapped up in if they can't afford to purchase the products, then they didn't have access to them. Mm-hmm. Um, so every every year since then, we've passed legislation. We created a task force to see how we incarcerate people in the state of Louisiana, you know, and all of these things. So I think we're at about six pieces of legislation that we've passed consistently since um, 2017 that continue to address the inequities, you know, um, in the systems that are here in Louisiana. And then I had an opportunity to work on a federal level on some federal legislation. Um, It started with the First Step Act. So I worked on the First Step Act. I was hired as a policy consultant for a nonprofit called Cut 50 that Van Jones and Jessica Jackson Sloan founded in California. And um, they reached out to me because of my success working passing legislation in southern areas and wanted me to um, work with them on the First Step Act uh, on a federal level. And I worked with them for about 18 months um, and we were able to pass that legislation. Um, Help us to understand what the First Step Act is, please. So the First Step Act was the first um, time that we successfully were able to address sentencing inequities um, in a federal on a federal level. There had not been any sentencing reform or anything that um, had passed. There had been attempts, but nothing had been successful um, in passing around, you know, they call it criminal justice reform. Mm-hmm. Um, so that act was simply born out of Jared Kushner had a father who was incarcerated and this became an issue that he wanted to work on Gary um, Kushner the son-in-law of mm-hmm. Donald Trump Donald Trump yes okay um, just want to make sure everybody knows who you're talking about <laughs> <laughs> he um, wanted to work on this particular issue mm-hmm. um, so this issue became a bipartisan effort to address the inequities that existed in the federal sentencing guidelines so mm-hmm. things as simple as you're supposed to get 54 days a year off your sentence for good time they were only actually giving people 47 there were um, issues around guns and how people are sentenced as it relates to guns and having possession of guns um, people who were sentenced as nonviolent first time drug offenders it addressed compassionate release it was just a multitude of things that was um, addressed in Mm -hmm. this piece of legislation so we worked and we worked really hard and we got the legislation passed um, in 2019 and we saw thousands of people that have been released um, from prison as it relates to um, the actual passing of this legislation But I've also worked on restoration of Pell for incarcerated students because my organization does work in that space of higher education in prison. So we worked on uh, Pell grants and making that accessible to people who were incarcerated. We were successfully able to pass that in this administration, the Biden administration, um, inside of one of the COVID relief packages. We were able to simplify FAFSA. Um, We know in our communities that a lot of the questions that um, made you ineligible for our Pell Grants, our federal support, were around drug questions, Mm -hmm. um, specifically, and that um, disproportionately impacted people of color. So we were able to remove those questions off of the FAFSA, and we've also um, been able to remove the question around criminal history off of the Common App. 
So um, over the last five years, that is where I have really um, been working and dedicating um, my life to is not only direct services and helping women who are released from prison, but also trying to um, address policy issues. In the course of uh, your work uh, with these policy issues, have you had the opportunity to have any encounters with uh, Mr. Kennedy? Uh, who, who who is the incumbent that you are running against? Did, did your paths ever cross uh, during any of these uh, efforts at legislation? Absolutely not. Um, his office never really takes the meetings. Um, he voted against the federal legislation um, that we were able to pass. Um, so he has not been a person who, and we see this time and time again, um, no matter what piece of legislation or part of the legislative process that we are working on, whether it's infrastructure, whether it's, you know, criminal justice reform, whether it's, you know, health care, whatever it may be, he consistently votes against things that are in the best interest of this state. So, no, I have not had an opportunity to um, run across him in my um, work in D.C., um, I think we've been on a plane once or twice together, and, you know, he doesn't really acknowledge, his, acknowledge people's presence either. So, yeah, that's my experiences with him. Your uh, pardon came from President Trump, mm -hmm. who is a Republican. Mm -hmm. uh, and you just mentioned that part of your policy work was due to... Uh, activities surrounding Jared Kirshner, who, of course, as the president's son-in-law, is a Republican. You're running as a Democrat. How do you respond to those who ask the question that I'm, that I'm about to ask? Do you feel any sense of uh, endearment uh, toward the Republican Party, toward uh, the, the MAGA movement, Make America Great Again movement? Uh, and, and if so, why would you choose to run as a Democrat as opposed to a Republican? So <laughs> I got a lot of flack the last time I answered this question um, because the comments, in the comments, people said that I seemed like I was ungrateful or I didn't appreciate the pardon. So I want to, you know, center it in saying that I am absolutely appreciative and grateful um, for an opportunity um, that I received as it relates to my pardon because the pardon that um, President Trump gave me took away my restitution. It freed me from things that I had been dealing with for over 20 years. So for that that I am, you know, really appreciative. So I wanted to start there. But, you know, on the flip side, I'm a, a, um, a praying woman. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very, um, very much so at peace with myself and my higher power. And the best way I can describe it is I think that God can use the devil to bless you. You know, that's, <laughs> that's what the text says. And I also think that... Um, a broken clock can be right twice a day. And if we are on this earth for a small amount of time to change the world in which we live and, and best serve our community, then again, I can't take it personal. And any time that I have an opportunity to work with someone, uh, for, whether it's a short amount of time or a long period of time, to get the things to the community that they need, I am willing to leverage myself in that way. Um, so I think me going in, I mean, and I got a lot of, like, flack, you know, from a lot of my counterparts that I work with on the West Coast and the East Coast, and they're like, how are you going to work, you know, with that administration? And I'm like, I am from Louisiana. Mm -hmm. The reality that Donald Trump is creating present day has been my reality my whole life. You know, we were just coming out of the reign of Bobby Jindal and the, the destruction that happened in the state mm -hmm. under his watch. And for me, the things that people were worried about on a national level were already our reality. You know, I remember one of my friends saying, well, Donald Trump wants to, you know, 
close down all public schools and become 100% chartered. I was like, yeah, that happened in New Orleans um, after Katrina. Mm -hmm. And, like, where was your outrage for that? Mm -hmm. You know? I graduated from a high school where in 1998 we still had a black and white prom. So there's still a pool in St. James Parish that they only sell shares um, in the pool to um, people who are white. And all of this is able to be done because you know I was listening to Brian Stevenson speak the other day and it's like we also have to really start focusing on narrative work and and shooting down the narrative of who we are as people and for me um, it is my responsibility to work with whoever I need to work with in order to bring change um, to the community and that's what I'm committed to um, the Democratic, the, the state Democratic Party uh, recently made a triple endorsement as opposed to a single endorsement. Uh, now, I'm of the opinion that endorsements only carry so much weight anyway. The biggest thing about endorsements, depending upon where they come from, has to do with the money that comes along with it. Uh, but the fact that the state Democratic Party chose to take the route that they took, in my opinion, made the Democratic Party look weak. You, you, you can't single in on, a, on, on one candidate. For me, it didn't matter which one. Uh, just focus in on a candidate. My vote is not going to be swayed by what the Democratic Party says one way or the other. But <clears throat> since you were one of the three, <laughs> share with me what your thoughts are about how that whole thing uh, worked itself out. So let me give you just a little bit of back, drop right background, because I think that the narrative that is out there right now is not um, a complete and total depiction or accurate depiction of what actually transpired. Let's start with the last congressional race that happened when Troy Carter, Gary Chambers, and Karen Carter and Peterson were running against each other. Mm -hmm. There was a triple endorsement then, mm -hmm. right? They endorsed all three candidates. So this isn't the first time mm -hmm. that this has happened, right? Um, there were some bylaw changes and rule changes that were supposed to be set in place to stop this from happening again. So the changes in the committee um, made the decision. It came out in March of this year. There were two missteps that actually happened in March of this year once the rules were changed in March of this year, a lot of the larger body, um, the DSCC members, were unaware that now candidates would go to the executive committee. They would interview with the executive committee. The executive committee would choose a candidate um, that they thought was for, um, that they wanted to endorse. And then the larger body would vote up or down, so yes or no, on the recommendation of the executive committee. So the larger body, whether they sent out the information or not, was unaware that candidates will no longer have an opportunity to speak to the larger body, and mm -hmm. the larger body would be able to vote on it, right? Then it was another significant piece of it that said that if one of the candidates wanted to challenge the Democratic um, Executive Committee's recommendation that they had to do it within five days of the actual larger meeting, and then someone had to nominate them from, from the floor. That information never made it out to candidates, okay. right? So in order to do something that is um, a change on that massive scale, there has to be communication out about the new change. Mm -hmm. So on the day of the meeting, you had DSCC members that were um, angry and upset, and then you had candidates that were angry and upset. When Representative Marcel introduced the memo um, to the larger body, it was addressing the fact that these rule changes had happened and that the recommendation would be um, that all three candidates were endorsed because there was not an opportunity for us to speak to the body as a whole because a lot of the people who had received the endorsement, um, recommended endorsement of the executive committee were not present. So they couldn't do it in one race and not all. So they chose to focus on the PSC race and this race and say, we're just going to endorse 
everybody. Do I agree or disagree with what you're saying? Absolutely not. But in their minds, they thought that this was the best course of action in order to um, address these inadequacies, right? I'm like you. <laughs> Endorsements don't vote. People do. Right. So for me, the endorsement process um, was not where I was focused. I didn't go into the room expecting an endorsement from the Democratic Party. Mm-hmm. I went into the room um, with one thing on my mind. I needed to meet as many people as possible, be able to speak to them so they can become aware of my candidacy and have people get an opportunity to know who I was. That is the goal that I went in with. Um, But to come out with an endorsement, again, you know, I can take it and I can move and I'm happy and I will post as if I'm the only person who got the endorsement, right? Mm -hmm. Um, For whatever it's worth. So I appreciate even being included, you know, in the resolution and I'm going to move from there. But I think what we can't allow to happen is like a full factual um, synopsis of what happened because I know a lot of people are saying that um, Gary was leading, which he was. That was the recommendation of the executive committee and that he basically was denied an opportunity to get the sole endorsement of the committee I'm sorry, of the, the Democratic Party as a whole, which there is truth, you know, in that statement. But the other piece is, is that the larger body had to vote up or down. Yes. And the consensus is, is that the larger body moved toward this not happening. And had he not gotten enough votes for the sole endorsement, they wouldn't have endorsed anybody. OK. Um, as you move forward from that. There have been other Democrats, African-American Democrats, who have endorsed the white Democratic candidate. Now, I know that politics is not totally racial, but race is one factor involved in our politics. Do you have any feelings about that at all? Uh, and, and if you don't, it's fine. No, I do. I, I have a lot of feelings about it. <laughs> I do, totally. But um, I think that people can support whoever they want to support, right? Mm-hmm. So black, white, green, purple, blue, whatever. You support who you feel like is right for you. Mm-hmm. I think what happens a lot of times, especially in this state, is there's always these conversations around viability and what people um, deem as valuable. I tell people all the time, I used to think me going to prison um, prepared me for the work that I did. But I was like, no, going to prison actually prepared me to run for office because I would be demoralized, um, low self-esteem and all of these other things. If I really believe the conversations that people have around viability, the state of Louisiana has never elected a black woman to statewide office in the history of the state. It's tied to these conversations around viability, Um, racism. Raising money, it is insane to think that African-American people have the same access to wealth that white people do, right? Mm -hmm. 94% of the people that are currently sitting in Congress right now on the the Senate side as well as um, the representatives, 94% of those people are independently wealthy. So there are only 6 percent of people that have managed to get elected that are not independently wealthy Mm -hmm. so even this ideology around viability i think is a um a barrier in our community about how we think about we how we are going to elect folks that represent community and the whole state you know as a whole so i think it starts there for me so i think that a lot of the endorsements come from what we perceive someone being electable in the state looks like versus all of us throwing our support behind someone who we know can get the work done. Um, I think that are, that's two very different conversations. And people who endorse, you know, particular sides, we can't, you know, ever discount money playing into those conversations. Um, but, you know, um, Luke often talks about He has the endorsement of John Bell Edwards. And for me, 
I think when I heard Governor Edwards say that Luke was the most qualified person for this position, it was really like a slap in the face, you know, to me, because his experience is, is as a, a Top Gun a pilot um, in the military, and now he flies planes for Delta. So for me, I don't know how that translates into this particular job and being the most prepared. But the real reason that I felt like it was a slap in my face particularly is I sit on two committees currently and have been appointed to those committees by the governor. Mm -hmm. So on the Louisiana Incarcerated Women's Task Force, I was appoint appointed to that committee by the governor and I was the Co the vice chair of that committee. And then I also sit on the Justice Reinvestment Oversight Council um, for the state of Louisiana to, um, you know, address how the um, reinvestment funds are being allocated throughout the state. So for me, what I really understood is, is that it, um, the, the person most qualified for this job doesn't actually mean experience. Um, it means what you think the people of Louisiana want in an elected official. <laughs> you got me a little speechless there. <clears throat> um, and that doesn't happen very often. Um, you said that there's never been a black woman elected to statewide office. Uh, to my knowledge, since Reconstruction, there's never been a black male elected to statewide uh, office in this state either. So it. it so PBS Pinchback was right. I, elected, but re Reconstruction. Was, right. He was yeah. never able to take office, but then he was appointed. You know, to the um, the seat. So you're absolutely um, right in saying black men either. But for me, you even have PBS point, Pinchback to point to, mm -hmm. even though, you know, you have like a, a small window of time where it actually happened, mm -hmm. you know, there. But a woman has never had, you don't even have before Reconstruction, after, it has never happened in mm -hmm. the history of this state, ever. And yet women seem to dominate uh, city and parish-wide government, black women. Uh, uh, the mayor of New Orleans is a black woman. Our mayor here in East Baton Rouge Parish, Sharon Weston Broom, is a black woman. Uh, much of our metro council is black females. Uh, why, why is it that you think black women can be successful in city and parish government, but not necessarily in state government. <laughs> You're going to try to get me in trouble. <laughs> Here, but I think if I'm honestly speaking, it is also um, the demographic of folks that are electing um, these women to office, right? Um, I don't think that a black woman will ever be elected mayor, I don't know, in my lifetime. It may happen eventually in West Monroe, for instance. Um, and there are a lot of parishes across the state that have that makeup or that demographic. I mean, when I think about West Monroe and meeting um, the alderman, Rodney Welch, up there, um, and him being the first black elected official, period. Um, there are a lot of places in this state that that is true. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that is what begins to carry us to finding the issues that black people have getting elected statewide in this state because we know the demographics and the makeup of the state as a whole. You know, when I first started doing this work, I didn't even realize. I was like, I just knew when I was going to get the studies of the demographic breakdown of women in prison that black women would be leading, you know, in incarceration. But that's not the case. We are disproportionately impacted. But there, actually, there were actually more white women incarcerated than there were black women. Mm -hmm. But that goes with the numbers, you know, in our state, even though we are disproportionately impacted. Um, so I think that. Yes, we've made tremendous strides, and black women are holding amazing offices, and we have some amazing black women that are leading, you know, in their jobs. But they're not enough, and they're only in certain pockets. Mm -hmm. So I think that we just have to have larger conversations around how do we become 
able and ready to elect representation um, across the state as a whole. You're running for a statewide office. Uh, the congressional seats are broken down into districts. Yes. Uh, state legislatures broken down into districts. Local uh, uh, offices are broken down into districts. We have just come through what I consider to be a horrendous redistricting session for this state and for Baton Rouge in particular. Uh, I had a guest here last week and uh, her work encompasses a lot of redistricting efforts and I say that we were 0 for 4. Uh, we lost in the congressional race, we lost in the state legislative race. Here locally we lost in the school board race and we lost in the Metro Council race. And all of these <clears throat> redistricting efforts are ending up in federal courts, but these days the federal courts <laughs> are not the salvation that they were 50 years ago because uh, conservatives have been able to manipulate judgeships in the federal court system to the point that you are no longer guaranteed a fair hearing from the federal court system. So I'm going to ask you the same question that I asked that guest uh, last time. And, and I'm only asking it because, not because I, I'm opposed to voting, because I vote. I vote for everything. Every time I have the opportunity to vote, I take advantage of it. But to me, it seems a little bit disingenuous to tell people, vote, 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 vote if your vote is being shoved into districts and uh, into uh, configured maps so that your vote does not have the same weight that it could have and you're still left being disproportionately misrepresented in so much of our government. Now, you're running for Senate, but redistricting at some point uh, becomes a federal matter and not just a state or a local matter. So can you share with me your thoughts about redistricting and what can be done to make it better as we go forward? For me, I hear you when you say vote, 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 but you, your vote is um, essentially trying to be silenced and, and made... Um, Invalid, I guess, is is the way, you know, that I, I want to articulate that. But I think it goes back to what I spoke about earlier, is that we have to not just focus on, like, the short game and the short-term goals. We also have to focus on the long game and the long-term goals at the same time. They can't be independent of one another. We can't ever take our eyes off of what the end goal is. Because I think a lot of times when we have certain successes, we be get, we become complacent. And we don't realize that the liberties and the rights of people um, are constantly under attack. You know, um, and a lot of times it's predicated on race, you know, but it's even predicated on gender. It's even predicated on your sexual identity. I mean, all of these things are under attack, and those things are not just um, racial. It's not just a racial thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that, like, you know, when you talk about marriage equality, people who achieve marriage equality never conceive that so soon it would be stripped away. Mm -hmm. But that is because people took their eyes off of things that um, didn't necessarily affect them or didn't necessarily affect their household. You know, um, Emmett Till's mom has a quote, I think when I went to the Smithsonian um, Museum, the Black History Museum in D.C., the most profound thing that I read on all of the walls and all of that history was a quote by her that said that she wasn't necessarily worried about the race wars and the racial, racial tension in the South because she was living in Chicago, I think, at the time. And that wasn't her experience. But the quote said, it wasn't my problem until it was. And I think we have to stop living in that mindset of it's not our problem until it is and re really begin to understand that it's always our problem. Like, we have to shift our thinking to know that all problems are our problems 
until they're not versus us saying it's not my problem until it is. You know, we have to retrain how we're looking at things because, you know, people talk about Roe versus Wade and being pro-life and pro-choice. And I often laugh. I said people who, you know, say that they are pro-life don't even, you know, they act as if that's not a choice, you know. So we're all choosing to do something and how we particularly decide that we show up in your family and in your life um, should not be what you force upon masses of people. So for me, I talk about how, you know, abortion is never a personal choice for myself. I've had struggles with, you know, getting pregnant. I had to have IVF with my daughter, my last daughter. Um, and I have a son and I had two miscarriages. So I have had all these experiences, but I am still able to stand up and say, even though this is not a choice that I believe for myself or my family, I don't believe that I have the right to tell someone else's family or another person what is right for them. So I think that everybody should be able to make that choice for themselves but what people didn't realize is that you know the overturning of Roe versus Wade implicates Griswold versus Connecticut yes. and it's like a, a shoestring you know and it's like you don't really even understand all of the things that can come crumbling down from the overturning of this one decision and Justice Thomas has advocated that we go back and review all of these uh, uh, controversial controversial uh, decisions uh, that have come through the Supreme Court. Absolutely. Because he wants to undo much of what has been, been done. done. Uh, you, you veered away from redistricting. Uh, I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> uh, it, it goes where it goes. But my concern, trying to get us back to redistricting for just a second, my concern is uh, at some point people are not crazy. You keep telling them to vote. And voter registration in this state is extremely high. People might not know that. But voter registration in the state of Louisiana is extremely high. But people get tired of going to the polls and voting and seeing no changes that come from that. And for me, redistricting was an opportunity to bring about a certain degree of change, a certain degree of positive change. And there was an arrogance on the part of uh, conservatives uh, on all levels of government to where they just said, no, we're not going to we're not going to do that. I sat in the room when the Metro Council uh, here locally made their vote. I was in the room when the school board made their vote. And the way that they did it was was. was <sighs> We came in, we, we, we presented our arguments, they, they gave us our time for discussion and debate. And when that was over, they did a motion and a second and a vote, and they got up and went home. Like, it doesn't matter what you say, it doesn't matter how you feel. That kind of, of, of uh, bully pulpit type of, of politics is frustrating to people, and I'm old, I'm 61, but to people who are younger than me, my, 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 my children are 25 and 27, and they have the patience of a gnat. Uh, so when, when, when this happens to people of that age group, uh, I just sense that at some point they're going to opt out and, 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 and say, well, my vote doesn't really matter. And, and I fear that because I, I do believe voting matters. I am a voter. But something has to be done to make my vote as relevant and as equitable as other people's votes. I agree. I mean, what you're saying is absolutely the case. But I know you're saying like we stick in the, the like going back to the redistricting specifically. But I feel like that arrogance comes every single time. We are trying to do something that needs to be done or should be done. I remembering being a part of the process when they were talking about removing the monuments. That same level of arrogance was there. I remember vividly a representative from Jefferson Parish had a um, a, a throw on that was cons it looked like a Confederate flag mm -hmm. and walked around in the legislature. I remember seeing, you know, people, um, black men and women like 
moved to tears about these particular instances and people were unmoved. It didn't happen. I participated in, you know, testimonies in the criminal justice um, committee in Louisiana. It's that same level of arrogance and disdain. So if you don't vote, those individuals will continue to get elected and that arrogance will still live. The narrative will still prevail and things are not going to change. Right. But to go back to specifically redistricting, that is happening because the tide of change was being felt. Mm -hmm. And any time in history a tide of change is being felt, there's going to be an active movement of resistance against um, people who are feeling oppressed to stop them from being liberated. So this is throughout history. Like, your feelings, my feelings, they're nothing new, you know, Um in the 70s, you know, when people were living free and hippie and, you know, flower child and all of that, that's, I feel like that's when I should have been born because I really, really associate myself with that. It wasn't all that. bad, trust me. But, I mean, <laughs> that is, like, my quintessential of also, like, free living, right, mm -hmm. um, that we have been able to document in history. I'm sure that people who came before that era thought that all was lost as well. Mm -hmm. um, somebody told me today, and I think this is what keeps me going, they said to me, Sarita, like, you're the right person to do this because you still believe in people. And it gave me pause, and I was like, you know what? I do believe in people, mm -hmm. and that is why I do what I do, because I still believe in people. And I think that we have to start making a collective movement around restoring belief um, in people and that people can be moved, they can be pushed, pulled, dragged, whatever, into doing what needs to be done. There is some discussion, um, I haven't heard it as much in the last couple of months, uh, but early on, uh, in this redistricting debacle, uh, there was some discussion about, well, it, it, it began with the Roe v. Wade reversal about expanding the Supreme Court. Uh, should you uh, be successful in winning your Senate seat, that would be something that would be on your table. What's your attitude about expanding the court? Um, I think... Anytime you can get more people or different heads in a room um, to make a decision is better. But it also goes back to the, the the tone of, like, if you put too many choices on the menu, then nobody knows what to order. So you have to be careful to still maintain that balance. Um, but, I, you know, I'm in support of it. I, I'm very supportive. But I think that what we also have to really, really think about you know, because I even talk about it when we talk about like filibuster conversations is there's always going to be a time in history where we're going to have a governing party or body that prevails. Mm -hmm. And if the Supreme Court was expanded during the last administration, you would have more people who are of this mindset on the Supreme Court mm -hmm. currently. Mm -hmm. So if we're talking about expansion for the specific reasons of balance, it will only be balanced until there comes a time where someone has an opportunity to unbalance it, whether that's for good or whether that's for harm, um, because that happens. And it's going to continue to be a shift until we put some strongholds in policy and be connected and committed to making sure that our highest court is always balanced. Well, let me push back on that just a little bit. The Supreme Court didn't start off with nine. It's, yeah. It started off with five. five. Mm -hmm. And and at some point it expanded from five, I believe, to seven, and then from seven to nine. To mm -hmm. nine. Uh, there are some state Supreme Courts that have as many as 13 and 15. So you're going to tell me that the state of New York can have 15 uh, state Supreme Court justices, but the United States of America can only have nine. Uh, and I also understand the fact that you run the risk of politicizing the court. But let's acknowledge the fact that the court has already been politicized. Absolutely. So uh, I know that civil rights would not be what it is 
uh, uh, Brown versus Board of Education would not have taken place were it not for the, the, the Supreme Court. Uh, the, the, the Civil Rights Act, uh, the Voting Rights Act, all of this was supported by a federal court system that said that these things were right. The things that you were talking about uh, earlier uh, having to do with same-sex marriage and abortion, all of that came as a result of the federal courts uh, uh, stepping in and saying that uh, at some, you know, at some portions of government we are 50 states, but at other portions of government we are one nation. And in these issues, one nation should follow this particular uh, course of action. I, I appreciate the idea that you have to be careful about how you do it. But I think that perhaps the time has come for us to acknowledge that the damage that has been done over the past 30 years by conservatives uh, is not going to be undone in any short period of time unless and until we find balance in, 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 in our federal court system. So let me clarify. I do think we need expansion. What I was trying to say was is that the same federal court just repealed Roe versus Wade. So what I'm saying is that until we also expand, rectify what has been wrong, mm -hmm. we also need to be working simultaneously to make sure that we are not in the same place again 30 years from now with an exp expanded Supreme Court and saying we need to expand again in order to um, counteract the last 30 years of like what has happened and transgressions that have been made because... When we expand it from five to seven to nine, like that is the thought process that we need to have a more balanced uh, federal judiciary. We need to have a more balanced um, way of coming up with how we are interpreting and codifying laws and all of these different things. So what I'm saying is I want to make sure that every 20 to 30 years we're not expanding in order to rectify like the wrongs that have been done over the last 20 to 30 years. I want to expand and work toward making sure that if we expand, it's a need for expansion, but not a need to fix something. So how do you really think about being intentional about making this balance? So is it that the Senate no longer confirms these appointments? Mm -hmm. Is it that we always have, you know, six conservatives and six, you know, liberals or however you want to term it. Well, let me and ask you this question. Do, do you believe, because another option that has been voiced is the idea of placing term limits on on, on the Supreme Court justices. Do you have a, a, a thought around that idea? I think that term limits should exist everywhere <laughs> because I think after so long, um, individuals... Um, are not connected in the way that they should be connected to the issues on the ground, mm -hmm. right? Because you, you 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 grow, you change, your ideologies morph. I think there's also something to be said about people who have been in a job 20 years and have knowledge that someone coming in on year one doesn't have. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that there's a balance, but I don't think it should be lifetime or until someone, you know, passes away or something of that sort. I think that there's a reasonable time frame in this amount of time that a person can contribute or, you know, whatever the case may be. But I don't believe that a person, um, when they started a job 50 years ago, is in the same mindset or openness um, that they would be 50 years removed. So I do think that there is value um, in term limits, but also wanting to make sure that you also value wisdom and knowledge about a particular um, discipline that a person is working in. Um, but I do believe, back to what we were talking about, I think that there is a way to expand the court and figure out how to make it more balanced um, in perpetuity, not having, and if we have to like look at, like I said, how we appoint Supreme Court justices, how we take recommendations, what committees they go through, because it also goes back down to like the committees that confirm and how people are able to apply, um, block appointments, mm -hmm. you know, 
just different things. I think that it has to be a trickle-down effect of the whole process of how a Supreme Court justice is chosen and placed um, and confirmed to begin to be in that position. But I am definitely not from the school of waiting until you figure it out to make a move. So I think you can be thinking about those things simultaneously while we're expanding. Do you favor uh, eliminating the filibuster in the United (laughs) States Senate? So for me, again, it's taken, even though the history of the filibuster was created in order to stop us Civil rights. as a people <laughs> yes <laughs> from moving forward i have seen it's amazing to me to hear these conservatives talk about it's 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 a tradition and and i and i don't want to touch this tradition it's a tradition because it was put in place to make sure that mm-hmm. negroes did not get the rights that the federal government was trying to guarantee them that's when it became a tradition. It doesn't date back to the founding fathers. There was nope. no filibuster at, nope. at that time. In the same way that the, the you know the the Jim Crow juries here that was overturned a nine unanimous jury that was put in place specifically to make sure that it negated the one or two black people that would be put on juries. The filibuster is no different in its origination and how. Um, It came to be. It was created for a specific reason. But what I tell people all the time is, is that we've also been able to use the filibuster to stop extremely bad things from happening. So for me, I would be willing to do away with the filibuster absolutely on this issue around Roe versus Wade with the notion and knowing that this is a tool that we will never be able to use again. So now my next thought is immediately, how are we going to block things that are harmful from the opposite end? Mm -hmm. So like, what is the creation of that thing? So, um, I just like to tell, you know, I just I, I like to lay it all out on the table and say we've only been able to use it effectively a few times. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, but it has still been there for us to use. So if you eliminate it, you're not going to be able to use it for good or bad. But I would eff- I mean, without a doubt, vote to end it. But I'm going to be immediately thinking about. So the next time something bad comes up, how do we stop it and begin mobilizing around that? One more question about about. Uh federal government politics. What's your attitude about the Electoral College? Oh, God. <laughs> I think that that definitely has to be eliminated as well. I think it it serves no purpose. I think that if we are going to trust the American people to elect someone, we go to the polls and we turn out en masse and we are electing our next you know, president, president. or yes. whatever. You know what I'm saying? Because... You know, there are a lot of little entities that have things across the country that also resemble like this electoral college process. But what it does is it's still a way to get what you want based on power and money and population and just like all of these things. And I think that if the vote says this, that is actually what should happen. It should not be an electoral college that um, is able to change it. But again, if we talk about the origination of the Electoral College and what it was started from and why it was started, um, we have to reconcile with that history. And um, I don't think that we are there anymore. And it is just time to do away with all of the relics that, you know, um, keep people oppressed. (laughs) As a United States senator, what would be your top priority agenda matters to uh, bring before the Senate and seek passage? Yeah, I think on day one, um, just because of the climate of the country, we have to address the Supreme Court issue and um, making sure that a lot of these decisions that we have put forth are not overturned. I think, you know, prior to the Roe versus Wade um, reversal, I wanted to focus on um, infrastructure because that is something that is really, really important, too. Have you talked to Mr. Graves about infrastructure here in in, in this state? Yes. Because he he seems to be a big (laughs) proponent of infrastructure improvement. But again, we're... 
me and him might not be on the same page with the type of infrastructure improvement okay. that we're talking about, right? Um, I've had an opportunity to travel across the state, and like we have multiple parishes and small towns in Louisiana that are present day Jackson you know, with water quality issues and how we make money available to improve water systems in this state. Like, I don't even know if people are aware of the depths of mm -hmm. issues that we mm -hmm. have as it relates to water quality in the state of Louisiana. I heard General Russell Honore on, uh, it was either MSNBC or CNN, saying that we are just one or two uh, incidents away from having the same problems in Louisiana on a massive scale Absolutely. that the city of Jackson is dealing with. And that's what I've saw when I've traveled this state, like speaking to these small town mayors, a lot of them are um, volunteers. Mm -hmm. They're not even getting paid, you know, to be the mayor of the city. And they take office with, you know, all of this debt for the city and they are town or they, you know, have liens against the town or the city. They can't even address the issues that they have because the cities and the, the, the towns are in such disrepair. I met um, one mayor. He also is the, the, the bill collector for the water department. They do the water and he's the mayor, you know, and we just begin, you know, talking. And what I've I've realized is this is a problem that over the years has been exacerbated by um, neglect, but also people coming in and praying on these small towns and parishes. Oh, we're going to fix your water system. They fix it. 15, 20 years later, they're back in the same problem because there's no money around maintenance. There's mm -hmm. no money that's being brought into the town in these grant processes and, you know, just all of these things. So when I talk about infrastructure, you know, I'm not just talking about, you know, um, interstates <laughs> running through historical areas and bridges that are being built on top of sacred ground. Like, that is not the infrastructure that I'm speaking of. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also talking about, like, I grew up, when I walk out of my house, there's a sugarcane field across the street. And very sure, you know, they grow a lot of sugarcane. And seeing those sugarcane fields disappear, but also, like, a lot of the new equipment that farmers are ha being um, able to gain access to, mm -hmm. they're all ran on Internet. All of the technology inside of these new tractors and new systems. So, A, you don't have anyone who can actually run it. But, B, if you did find someone to run it, you might not have Internet available to you or broadband in order to power these vehicles that are supposed to take us into, you know, the next century. Louisiana has some of the best soil in the country, you know, um, and I would argue almost in the world. And we have become a larger um, importer than we are exporting because we're not invested in in becoming a top um, exporter again. So when I speak about infrastructure, it's infrastructure in these rural communities that really will drive home some economic opportunities um, for folks. I think also like our kids are leaving in waves, you know, because they feel as if there is nothing here for them. Mm -hmm. And if we are losing talent hand over fist, then who is going to come in or who's going to be committed to staying here to bring us, you know, to the next level? So um, initially, you know, that was a big part of what I wanted to focus on. And also, you know, addressing the rights of women and the issues that women face um, in the country. Louisiana has one of the highest, you know, maternal mortality rates. I, as someone who worked in the hospital, who is able to converse and talk about and know exactly what's happening because of my degree in clinical laboratory science and working in the lab for a really long time, I even had my scare, you know, when I had my daughter um, and I had to stay in the hospital um, five days after I had her because... Um, her arm was stuck behind my pelvis and being there and not really understanding it's called shoulder dysplasia but not really understanding um, how that could affect me and how when I'm laying on the table all of my expertise and being able to advocate for myself is impacted by delivery you mm -hmm. know and not being taken seriously and you know it took for me to like really just lose it 
for someone to come in. And then I was in surgery within five minutes because I had a hema internal hematoma and was bleeding in the inside. You know, so even thinking about those things as it relates to women and women's rights and how the rights of women are under attack, you know, I think that those are all some things that, you know, I wanted to look at and address. But I think, you know, day one, it has to be about making sure that we um, codify Roe versus Wade and then also moving toward protecting any of these other, you know, um, controversial, as you said, decisions um, from being um, removed. Mm-hmm. <sighs> This is a church podcast, so let me turn our attention towards faith for a minute. Um, how does your faith impact the work that you do, your, your advocacy work, and your decision to seek public office? I mean, I don't think that anything that I have been able to accomplish or do um, did not come from God. I am... The person who uh, I tell people all the time that when I went to prison, I was 19, and I remember being in a car, it's around Mardi Gras, and me wanting to leave church to go and buy an outfit because I didn't have anything to wear to the parade on Sunday. And I, and I had been arrested for the charge, but I was out, you know, for three weeks prior to actually going back in. And I remember, I mean, clear as day, it was as if somebody was sitting in the car with me and was like, you need to be in church, you need to listen, you need to do this. And I'm in my mind saying, I am 19 years old. Why are you trying to call me to be holy or be in church and doing all this? Like, I just want to have fun. I want to drink and I want to party. And no, I'm not doing this. So it was like this internal battle and it was like two voices. Mm -hmm. And what I call my higher power and what I, I, I understood is two days later, I was in prison and wasn't released for 10 years. So what I learned really early on was that there was a calling in my life to, you know, fight. Um, for people and to believe in people um, and do the things for people that they are unable to do for themselves. And then my disobedience just comes at a higher cost, you know, and I'm aware. And what I try to do is always move in a spirit of obedience to what it is that I feel like I am called to do um, and try to get there with, you know, as least resistance as possible because I can be pretty stubborn or, you um, tone deaf or act like I don't hear, you know, or whatever. But lately I've been in this space of, you know, I never understood when I was young, my mom would ride and she had us listen to gospel music all the time. I'm like, Lord, why is she listening to this? Like <laughs> killing me, you know, but I find myself now listening in and like, oh, I need this one today. You know, I need to hear this today. And I think that for me, I know the strength and the stamina and uh, the conviction that I feel about what I do. Um, it couldn't possibly come from me, that it comes from, you know, um, it comes from the Lord. And I mean, every time I show up somewhere, so something happens and I'm like, I was just reading this scripture, you know, and just the spirit of manifestation in my life that if I think about something, um, most of the time it comes to fruition. So I am very um, grounded in my faith. I know that I would not have made it through prison um, for 10 years without being grounded and strong um, in my faith, even when I didn't know that I was. Mm -hmm. Um, and so now for me, you know, I take that everywhere that I go, you know, um, so that's about all I can say about that. Wrapping up, uh, I appreciate the time that you have given to us today. Uh, you mentioned your children. Mm -hmm. Uh, I generally ask this question of first time guests. Do you want your children to grow up? in this state or do you want them we, we, we talked about young people leaving uh but uh your personal feeling i mean absolutely i can't imagine them growing up anywhere else as much as i have 
problems and I, I, I will call out the state every chance I get on the things that they're not doing correctly. I've tried to move other places. I, I've tried to live, you know, um, in different states and I always end up back here. And it's because I believe in this state. I believe that growing up here, you have experiences that you will never have anywhere else. And I do believe that it prepares you to be successful through your experiences. Um, but also being very, very cognizant and aware that the life experiences that Louisiana prepares you for is not necessarily the experiences that children should have to learn at such a young age. Um, I think when you are from here, you're resilient. You um, can face anything, you know, in life. But that doesn't necessarily always translate into a Fortune 500 company, mm -hmm. you know. So um, I think that I can't imagine them growing up anywhere else. But I do think as a parent, it's my responsibility to expose them to all that I can outside of Louisiana and hope that it builds an appreciation from where for where they're from, mm -hmm. but also be able to understand the contributions that they need to make in order to make it a better place. Last uh, opportunity, look at that camera and tell our listeners, our viewers, why they should consider Sarita Stive before the United States Senate. <sighs> so... I am asking for your vote um, starting October 25th and on Election Day, November 8th. My number is number 12 on the ballot. Um, but the reason why I believe that I am the right person for this position at this time is because I don't believe that anybody is going to fight or work as hard for the people, all people of this state, in the same way that uh, I will. I am the only person with the experience to be able to start working on day one um, as I enter office. A lot of the relationships that people need to build in order to be effective in the U.S. Senate, I have currently, present day, due to all of the work that I've been doing over the last uh, five years. I think that there is time, this is a time for individuals to come together and really do what's in the best interest of the state. Um, I am from rural Louisiana, and I think a lot of times uh, rural Louisiana is left out of the conversation. So I want to bring rural Louisiana to the front of the conversation right alongside of big city Louisiana and bring the state forward um, as a whole. So I think this is why I am the person for the job, and I would appreciate your prayers, your support, and your vote on November 8th. Thank you. Sweetest Stott, thank you for taking the time to come and share with us today. Thank you for viewing. Thank you for listening. We'll be back again next time. Thank you for having me.